we are really pleased tonight to have Michael Manson with us to lead us through New Hampshire by Robert Frost. And the, this year has several poetry pieces in it, which is very nice because last year we had some, some non-poetry. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't do, who do prose as well as poetry, we had some non-poetry last year in many of the discussions. And we ranged from science fiction, one that I led, to some others that were um, really intriguing novels with lots of discussions built around them. That, um, as well as one of our faculty members from the physics department who was repeating all of Benjamin Franklin's experiments with electricity. Um, watching the graduate students lug all of the equipment from the physics building to, to the library, or actually to the SIS building, was pretty interesting as well. So wait, let me introduce to you um, Michael Manson, who is the director of the university's Honors and Scholars Program. He teaches in the literature department and is the author of several articles regarding modernist poetry and poetic form, discussing Robert Frost, Sterling Brown, Jay Wright, Lorene Nidecker, Gary Soto, Robert Haas, and Emily Dickinson. He's the editor of The Calvinist Roots of the Modern Era, and his book project now is entitled Body Language, Modern American Poetry and the, Poeti and the Politics of Poetic Form. He served as the president of the Robert Frost Society and as the executive director of the Northeast Modern Language Association. And in 2005, he organized a symposium poetic form for the American Literature Association. He received his bachelor's degree from Rice University and a master's and a PhD from the University of Virginia. And we're delighted to have you at this podium in the library tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. And welcome. Um, I'm going to talk about Frost and about New Hampshire. And I'm curious, um, we're, we, you know, I'm going to do a little introductory material and then we'll look at some poems um, and discuss those. But I'm curious before we get into those poems, whether there, there were issues that you were hoping that we would uh, raise and discuss or whether there were particular uh, items from Frost poetry that you were hoping to touch on. Uh, so I thought I'd start off with the questions. A little bit, yes? I'm interested in uh, the influences on Frost poetry. I I had been reading recently Keats, for instance, and um, read Keen Fitful Gusts and thought, boy, this sounds quite frost. Mm -hmm. So um, that was, that's something that I hope we might talk about, his influence, people who have been to poets who have influenced okay. Frost. Other questions? Other things you hope we will touch on tonight? Yes, Nancy. If we had had a poet laureate during the time of his life, would he have been one? He was. He was the poetry consultant to the Library of Congress. Um, before the formal poet laureate. Before, before that role became um, uh, the poet laureate. And he um, you know, asked for Congress to consult him. He kept saying that you know, they should really be coming to him for advice. Nobody took him up on it. But he did go to Russia um, during that time. Um, and scandalized the Kennedy administration when he got back. Um, yes? Uh, I, I don't know whether it's appropriate, uh, but uh, can you talk about his family life, or do you want to just talk about his poetry? Sure. I'd like to know if um, stopping by Words in the Snowy Evening is about suicide. <laughs> what do you think? Right. OK. That, that's, that sounds like a good good uh, place to start. Anyway, um, so one of the things I, I want to focus on tonight is this question of the extent to which poetry can shape a nation. Um, it seems to me that um, a lot of the, the books on the library's list are, are obvious. Common sense makes sense to put on there as something that shaped the American way of thinking and the feminine mystique. Um, I like the history of Standard Oil being up there. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous has certainly shaped the way that Americans think about um, our behavior, how we um, act toward one another. Uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X has affected lots of people. So all of those items on the list make sense. When it comes to fiction, uh, you know, 
the, the list changes a little bit. And it, it seems to me that a lot of the characters on this list are people that we kind of model ourselves on or we recognize in other people and we try to stay away from. Um, so, you know, Atlas Shrugged has provided characters for people to guide their lives by. Catch-22 has become a phrase that explains the kinds of situations we find ourselves in all the time, especially when we're dealing with bureaucrats. I try to remember that. Uh, Catcher in the Rye, of course, has given us a kind of touchstone for what we think of the relationship between teenagers and adult society. Um, there are certainly lots of people running around thinking that they're scarlet. Uh, and so these, you know, these have given us characters and situations that we all respond to in some, some way and that it seem to capture part of the American story. One of the items that I really like on the list, there's Horatio Alger, right? His novels went so far into in explaining what Americans thought they could achieve in the United States. Um, I was a little disappointed that the Virginian isn't on the, the library's list because that affected so much of the way that we think about the West. Um, but can poetry shape um, how Americans think about themselves? And it seems to me that lyric poetry, I'm sorry, I'm on, I'm on the wrong way. Narrative poetry um, comes in there, right? But narrative poetry provides the same kind of thing that fiction does. Um, and does, does anybody notice anything about the items on this list? These are all poems that have really, really um, affected the way that we think about. We're all pre-Civil War. All pre-Civil War, right? Mm, not sure. One of my favorite items on the list is Evangeline, The Tale of Arcady, which ended up affecting the way Cajuns think about themselves, right? If you go to Cajun country in Louisiana, there's a statue of Evangeline, a fictional character, right? The, the Cajuns have adopted this character from a poem as, as their, uh, their mascot, right? Their type of themselves. Other things that you all notice about that list? One poet. Longfellow. Longfellow. <laughs> it's Longfellow, right? Longfellow wrote Paul Revere's Ride. He wrote The Courtship of Miles Standish. He wrote Evangeline. He wrote The Song of Hiawatha. Um, I only put Poe up there because he's the only guy to have a football team. Right? Um, and have, to have poetry directly inspire a football team, I think it has to be mentioned. Right? It's got to right? So the Baltimore Raven. Um, so narrative poetry. The, the narrative poems that have really shaped a lot of American consciousness have come out of Longfellow. They come out of the 19th century. The 19th century was a boom era for narrative poems. Usually when we think about poetry, we think about the lyric. Um, and lyric poetry uh, has a different kind of shaping influence on the way um, we think, we Americans think. Um, and so these are, these are the, the four of the five books of lyric poetry that appear on the 88 books that the Library of Congress mentioned. <laughs> and the char one characteristic of all four of these, these poets is that they're, they're countercultural. They're rebellious against American society in some kind of way. Each of these four writers is launching a critique of American society. Um, whereas the one lyric poet who's not is, is Frost. And so I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the kind of unique place that Frost has in the American imagination and in American history. He's the benefit of a lot of uh, accidents here. That uh, he, his career, right, he was born in 1874. Uh, he publishes his first book in 1913 when he's around 40, right? So he's 39 when he publishes his first book. And then he lives to 88. And, and in, the, in those 88 years, he ends up encapsulating a big chunk of the American century. The United States came um, into power in World War I um, and solidified that in World War II, and he's riding the crest of that wave. Um, during that year, era, we need culture heroes. We need, the United States needs people who can kind of, they can present, right? So the U.S. Information Agency is born in this era. Uh, the Poetry Consultant, the Library of Congress, that role is born during this era. Um, Frost works for both of those, um, those outfits. Uh, then you've got the rise of the university after the Second World War. The GI Bill brings a lot of people in. Uh, and we get a new kind of position called Poets in Residence. Every university, every college has a poet in residence, or, or maybe two. Uh, that creates a higher profile for poetry than had ever existed before. But it also, it also is ensconced in the, in, the, in the university. 
Frost was one of the first poets to make a living going from one uh, university to another. He called it barding around. And so when you open up New Hampshire, the volume, you'll see that it's dedicated to Vermont and Michigan. Right? There's kind of a joke there that this book about New Hampshire would be dedicated to two other states. But these are the states that he had teaching jobs in. Right? So he was one of the first poets to start hopping from one university to another, teaching classes. Uh, and uh, he had a 25-year relationship with, with Amherst College, but he taught at a lot of other places around him. He gave lots of reading at other colleges. Colleges are expanding. They want the American populace to seem educated. Poetry is a way of doing it, and Frost is a big beneficiary of that. He was also on hand at the founding of the Breadloaf um, Poets Conference. And so that's, this is one of those early writing workshops when people are starting to learn how to write. Um, and then, of course, He's the first poet to read at a presidential inauguration. And so he, he, he read for um, Kennedy. He had predicted that Kennedy would win because he was a good New Englander. Um, so he read at Kennedy's inauguration. He was the first one to do that. The second one was, the second poet to read at an inauguration was? Angela, right, at, at Clinton's. Um, and so the whole kind of Clinton-Kennedy thing, he was trying to parallel with the poetry. Um, TV is rising at this time, and mass high culture is happening, so there's all these brainy shows that you want to put on Sunday, and you need poets for that. And so Frost would appear on these television shows um, at the same time. So uh, he becomes a kind of cultural icon. Uh, but let's, that, that's enough for the introduction part of it. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk about New Hampshire. Uh, the other thing that is going on uh, at this time is modernism, right? And you guys were, I, I might be familiar with modernism. That it's the great poetic movement and artistic movement. It affected all the arts. It's happening between World War I and World War II. Frost was part of this movement. He was friends with Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound um, helped him when he was first starting getting published and getting known in London um, in 1912. But he was also different from the modernists, and he liked to fight with the modernists. And so um, even though he was one of them and he was incorporating the kinds of rebelliousness and the kind of subversiveness that you find in other modernist writers and artists, Frost also never left Longfellow behind. One of the unique things about Robert Frost is that he wanted to be the Longfellow of the 20th century. Um, while he was in London in 1913, um, and you know, kind of meeting these modernist circles in London, uh, he wrote back to one of his former students, a guy named John Barton, he said, Ezra Pound is the poet of the coterie. He's the kind of guy who's going to be popular with people who are in the know. I don't want to be that. I want to sell books in the thousands. So he wanted, you know, he grew up in an era, born in 19, 1874, he grew up in an era of the schoolroom poets. Every American had their, their copy of Longfellow and Whittier. Um, and he wanted to be that kind of poet for the 20th century. He wanted everybody to read him. One of the reasons why he went to all these universities and gave all these readings is he wanted ordinary people to read his poetry and connect with it. And he also wanted the, the intellectuals, the, the Pounds and the Yates and the Eliots of his time to read his work and respect it. Um, and so he worked a difficult line between the uh, kind of highly advanced, highly intellectual writing of, of his peers and something that would be broad-based and popular. Um, and so it's very difficult. And I've tried. I've tried really hard, and I've tried hard with my students to read Longfellow and enjoy it. It's really hard to enjoy <laughs> Longfellow. I've worked very hard at it. I love his, some of his poems. But it just doesn't sell. Frost you can stay with, right? There's a kind of intellectual depth in Frost that remains. I, there's too many Longfellow fans in this room, right, I guess. Um, so, you know, one important thing to remember about Longfellow is that he was enormously respected in his day. He sold more poems in England than Tennyson did. And Tennyson was the poet laureate. He was the first American to go to England and get honorary degrees from Oxford and Cambridge. The second American was Robert Frost. So both of them kind of worked this, this, um, this line very, very strongly and very well. One of the things that Frost thought was the, 
the, be the secret to straddling this line and appealing to both auto audiences, right, the high intellectual audience and then the broad audience. What he thought would be key is that he felt like the modernists were trying new ways of being new. And he said, I want to try the old way of being new. So he was going to try to say new things and put forward new situations, but do it in the kind of traditional verse form that people were aware of. Right? And so in 1924, he publishes New Hampshire. It's his fourth collection. You all wanted a little bit of information about his family life and so on. Frost was 38. Well, he was, uh, he was 38 when he finally learned how to write. Right? This is one of the great kind of um, interesting developmental secrets about Frost. He was a lousy poet all through his 20s and for most of his 30s. He eventually gave up writing poetry and turned to short stories. Um, and this is in like 1910, 1911. Uh, meanwhile, he's had four kids, he's on a farm raising them, uh, then he gets a teaching job, and it's when he's starting to teach at uh, Pinkerton Academy in, in New Hampshire that he starts experimenting with short story writing, and he starts doing exercises in his class where students take plays and shorten them into small narratives. He would have them rewrite Shakespeare and shorten it down, uh, trying to increase the dramatic structure of it. And the result of this hard work in the short story and in short story forms was the book North of Boston, which was published a hundred years ago this year. Right? So in 1914 it was published. That is his great masterpiece, where he really remade the way that people can write narrative poetry um, in English. It's a brilliant volume, and the Library of King and Congress walked right past it. Um, for reasons that I'll get to in a couple of minutes. The, uh, So he rides that wave. He publishes North, uh, first um, uh, A Boy's Will, which collects the best of his early work and some of the new work that he's doing. Then North of Boston a year later, and then two years later he does Mountain Interval, and he's used it up. He's used up all that juice that he had in, right when he was turning 40 to kind of recreate himself, and he waits another eight years to publish New Hampshire. And, and, and when you read the volume, how many of you read it cover to cover? Did anybody take on that tour? Anybody read New Nancy. Hampshire cover to cover? Nancy did? You get an A, all right. There you go. So uh, did, did you stay awake during the first half of that book? Yeah? yeah. Right. Okay. The I find the first half of the book pretty tough going. Um, and it's, Frost is really struggling to figure out um, how to keep writing narrative poetry after the big burst he had around 40. Um, and he has some successes, I think, but then there's these satirical and didactic pieces that he's trying to put together. He's trying on a few new modes in this, in this book. Um, I think that what he does do in this book is discover his lyric voice, and he discovers a new kind of form of American lyricism. Um, and that's the great contribution that I think this book has to his work in general. Um, this is the watershed moment for him when he discovers his lyric voice. Um, and so let's look at the structure of the book for a moment. Um, I, I mentioned that he's going to try to be new in the old ways in this book. And so he does it in three kinds of ways. First, in the first section, well, I mean, before I get there, before I get there, let's do this thing here. The subtitle, A Poem with Notes and Grace Notes by Robert Frost. 1924, I hope the date is ringing a bell to you. In 1923, the great big moment in, a, in really world poetry happens. Right? T.S. Eliot publishes The Wasteland. Huge, big thing, right? It changes the way everybody thinks about poetry, about culture. Um, lots of people are talking about poetry, and that's something I sh should have mentioned a little bit earlier. This, this is an era when lots of people read poetry and discussed it. Um, and so when he describes New Hampshire as a poem with notes and grace notes, he's making fun of the wasteland, right? The May wasteland here on the right has notes to it. It's the first poem that gets published with footnotes, right? And he has his head note, not only the title, but the plan, a good deal of the incidental symbolism the poem, or suggested by Jesse Weston's book on the Grail Legend. Really? You're going to put that on your poem? And then, you know, Eliot has footnotes, line 20, look at uh, Ezekiel 2, chapter, uh, um, chapter 2, verse 1, read Ecclesiastes, <laughs> chapter uh, uh, book 12, verse 5, 
read book five of Tristan and Isolde versus, this is crazy, right? Nobody had seen poetry with footnotes before. And so Frost decides a year later to mock it when he's writing New Hampshire. So New Hampshire is what, 10 or 12 pages long? Um, Nancy, did you stay awake during that poem? Well, I did, but I read aloud. <laughs> Okay. I wanted, to, I wanted to get the cadence of it. Yeah, there's just so many cringeworthy and cringe-inducing <laughs> moments of the poem. Right? I was lately in conversation with a New York New York Alec. I was talking about the pseudo phallic, and it's like, oh God, please stop. <laughs> so, it's to my mind at least really dreadful, um, dreadful poetry. But there are little jokes in here, right? That he gives a footnote, and the footnote is, you know, confer page 41, the grindstone, confer page 37, the axe helm. He's referring to his own poems, right? <laughs> so he's self-referential in a way that, well, Eliot is, right? That's part of the satire. Um, and, and, and if you're a Horace scholar, and I'm not, right? But Horace scholars will tell you there's lots of Horatian um, uh, references in, and so you were looking for some of the influences on Frost, Horace, Lucretius, Epi um, Epicurus um, were, were big ones. Frost went to college in the day when, I'm sorry, not college, he went to high school in the day when you had a choice between being in the Latin program or being in the English program. He chose the Latin program. His girlfriend was in the English program. Uh, they eventually got married. Uh, but uh, she was the valedictorian of the English program. He was the valedictorian of the Latin program. Usually they let the, the valedictorian of the Latin program speak, and he said, no, no, I want to be co-valedictorian. He was putting the moves on her that early. Um, but they got married and they stayed married right through the end of their days. Um, so for us is, is being self-referential in these, uh, these footnotes, mocking the way that Eliot is being is referencing to things, but he feels like it's too self-referential, too, too much displaying your learning on your sleeve. Um, and one of the things that Latin scholars have said about Frost is that he is deeply read and that you, you don't notice those references unless you are deeply read in the classics. Um, and we'll look at one of those classical poems a little bit later. Um, so the poem is, is really a direct attack and mockery of, of T.S. Eliot. When Frost published this, um, these poems in his collected works, Henry Holt was able to persuade him not to have the footnotes. So when you go to the collected poetry, the footnotes were all taken out. The, the subtitle of the volume, of, of, you know, a, a poem with notes and, and grace notes, are taken out there too. So he's got Horatian satire as one of the new, uh, one of the old ways to be old. Um, then the second section of the book is entitled Notes. So all of the footnotes that appear in New Hampshire, the ones that are referring to other poems he wrote you can find in the notes section. So you can read the Axel, you can read the Grindstone, you can read the other poems that uh, he's looking at. Uh, mostly what he's up to in the notes section is continuing his experiments with narrative poetry. Uh, I think there's a falling off there, uh, but you, you all might, dis might disagree. Uh, the last section of the book, and the, book, the section that really makes it for me, is this grace notes section which is a nice little pun, right? You know, grace notes are, are from music. They're the little notes that you add in there to make everything wonderful and light. Frost said a couple of things um, that I think really bear on this. When he, was a, when he was at high school, he said what he really wanted to most write was a tender, touching thing. Um, and that's the lyric. That's that lyric tradition. You try to write something that's really tender and really very moving. Um, the other thing that he said is that he wanted to lodge one or two poems where they'd be difficult to get rid of. That was his ambition in life, was to lodge one or two poems where they'd be difficult to get to, to get dislodge, um, to get rid of, is the phrase. One of the books he carried around was Paul Graves' Golden Treasury. Uh, now I'm holding like the 1926 edition, so it doesn't make any sense. It's just the one that, that the copy I happen to have. Paul Graves collected this, um, this edition in 1861. And it's still getting um, revised and updated to this day. So it's gone through many revisions. Um, and this is the book that Frost really wanted to appear in. Um, he eventually got into it in 1954. Um, Cecil Day-Lewis, the great British poet and father of Daniel Day-Lewis, um, was the first person to put Frost in, the, in Paul Graves' Golden Treasure. Um, 
It's the, the Golden Treasury selects from the best songs and lyrical poems in the English language. And Paul Gray was serious about that. I like his last sentence here. Uh, the, well, okay. This little collection, is, it is believed, differs from all others in the attempt to made to include in it all the best original lyrical pieces and songs in our language by the writers not living and none beside the best. So he's not going to take any little stuff, right? Not any weak stuff. He's only going to put the very best poems in here. And then I love his last sentence. The editor will regard as his fittest readers. Right? Who's the best reader for this book? The best readers for this book are those who love poetry so well that he can offer them nothing not already known in value. There are no surprises in this book. If you're a really good reader, then you've read all the good stuff and you know what's good and what's weak. And that only the good stuff is in here. Frost said, I want to end up in Paul Graves' golden treasure. Um, and so I think he did it. So, if, so here's the quiz. I know you promised him no quizzes, Nancy, but here's the quiz. And when Frost said he wanted to lodge one or two poems where they'd be difficult to get rid of, number one, was he right? And number two, what are the two poems? I kind of gave away the answer to number one, like all good quizzes. Stopping by the woods. Stopping by woods has got to be in there. And two roads diverge in the yellow Okay, road not taken. Yeah. yeah. After apple picking. After apple picking is in there. Fire and ice. Fire and ice is in there. So those are those are poems that I think most of us would recognize. And I think you can still say something about the road not taken, and you know uh, somebody will pick up M. Scott Peck, and somebody else will pick up Frost. But people <laughs> know that phrase, right? They know it comes from somewhere. He's really entered our language in that way. After apple picking is another one that's really entered the, the Mending language. Wall. Mending wall is there. Um, mountain Inter Mountain Interval was his third book, right? This is New Hampshire is, is his fourth. Mountain Interval starts with the road not taken which suggests that Frost knew that he got it, right? He knew that he had created a great lyric and he was going to start the volume with that lyric. He starts north of Boston with Mending Wall. He knows he's got a good poem there, so he puts it in there. Um, Stopping Eye Woods appears in this volume and it's going to tell a little bit different story, so that's the teaser for it. All right, so <clears throat> let's do some poems. I've talked long enough. This is my favorite, I can't say it, I can't say anything's my favorite in, in Frost, so I won't try. This poem is one of my favorites, a boundless moment. He halted in the wind, and what was that? Far in the maples, pale but not a ghost. He stood there bringing march against his thought, and yet too ready to believe the most. Well, that's the paradise in bloom, I said. And truly it was fair enough for flowers had we but in us to assume in March such white luxuriance of May for ours. We stood a moment so in a strange world, myself as one his own pretense deceives. And then I said the truth, and we moved on, a young beech clinging to its last year's leaves. One of the things about um, I think lyric poetry, and if, especially if we're talking in the Library of Congress's notion that these book, these poems shaped us. One of the themes, that's, a number of the themes that start emerging in New Hampshire is the way that we are, we Americans are just looking for transcendence, right? We are trying to find some way of reaching beyond ourselves, of experiencing a moment that is boundless, right? That exists outside of time and space. Um, the you know we're. Uh, Frost grew up, um, he had a strange upbringing, uh, he had a strange upbringing. Um, but he, he basically grew up a Swedenborgian mystic. And in an interview that he published, that was published just a year before this volume came out, uh, came out he was asked, and he said, I'm still a mystic. Um, I still believe in symbols. Um, he's no longer a Swedenborgian, uh, <laughs> but he's still a mystic. And so he's looking for what he called elsewhere nature favors, places where nature gives us a gift and we're able to rise above and see outside ourselves. And so he's on this walk with a buddy and he sees a flower. Well, he sees something white in the distance, right? Um, it's March and it's March in New England. I don't know if you've walked in the New England woods, but there's, no, there's nothing blooming in March in New England. It's just not happening. And so he sees that his friend thinks that he sees a blooming flower. He says, okay, I'm going to tease this guy. 
hey, look, it's a paradise in bloom. You know, the other guy goes, yeah, I guess it is. Right? He completely tricks his friend into thinking that it's possible that in March, a flower that only blooms in May would flower. And so for a moment, kind of time and space have been broken free of, and you get to experience a flower that's really aptly named paradise in bloom, right? Can we have paradise? Can we feel moments of ecstasy and transcendence even in winter, even when we're down, even when things are bleak? Um, and his buddy's like, yeah, that's possible, that's cool. And then Frost is like, nah, I got you. <laughs> it's really just a beech tree. Right? And if you've seen beech trees, they have white parchment-like um, leaves, and they don't drop them in the winter. It's the strangest thing about beech trees. If you, if you drive through Rock Creek uh, Park, You'll see them all, all through the winter. They're the only tree in Rock Creek Park that has any leaves except an evergreen. And so they're dried up, they're, they're, they're tan colored, um, and they're playing with um, And so he's had fun, poking fun of his, of his friend. He's gotten his friend to believe, he's deceived his friend into believing for a moment. And so this is one of, this is uh, some of Frost's persistent themes, that he likes breaking barriers, he likes experiencing transcendence, he likes to deceive himself, and he likes to deceive his friends. Um, those kinds of deceptions, you don't find in Longfellow, right? When I talk about how you know, Frost is really updating Longfellow, you don't find that kind of stuff in Longfellow. Um, he is, he believes that poetry, he said at one time, that poetry should trip us forward into the dark. We should discover something new about ourselves in the dark. And so what do you think, he, what, you know, how do you justify this deception? Why would he think that deception is a good thing to be practicing at home like this? Why is it good to trick our friends? We'll find out what kind of friend you are by your answer. You also find out who you are when you're disillusioned. You find out who you are when you're disillusioned, so... So, deceit can be self-deceit. Mm -hmm. and, and someone, something happens like that, and Away, you see yourself. So you or see yourself in this case as somebody who is too ready to believe the most? Could be. Yeah. Could be. And, but he's playing, as you say, he's playing uh, a trick on his friend. And that's, I don't know whether Frost realized that. He must have. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he, he knows it, right? Because we, we stood a moment so, because he tricks himself. It's not just his friend. We stood a moment so in a strange world. Myself is one his own pretense deceives. Now that's very tricky language. Okay, did it deceive you or not? Let, you know, let us know. He's using tricky language because he doesn't know. He might have purposefully deceived himself and him, his friend into thinking that it could possibly be something that it's not because he enjoys this experience of boundlessness. Is that what we do every time we're seeking transcendence? Are we always fooling ourselves in a moment of ecstasy? Now that's the, that's the kind of cold-hearted, modernist, scientific, rationalist answer. Frost is, is this interesting blend of a real cold rationalist and also a very tender um, transcendentalist. Um, he, he wanted to believe both things at once. Um, and you can see in poems him, him flirting around with Okay, what, what do I believe? Am, am, are my moments of transcendence real? Or are they self-deceptions? And if they are self-deceptions, does it matter? That's the great conclusion of Road Not Taken, right? It doesn't matter whether the, the trail is worn or not. It's For you, it's the first day you walk down that path. It so might as well be the road. But since we know the truth, which is that it isn't, where is the, how, do, how does transcendence relate to I mean, it's kind of like... Because for a moment, he's in a strange world. Yeah, but then he was wrong. Yeah, so there you go. No, but, but, <laughs> but, but I have just a different question. So we stood a moment so in a strange world. Is that an echo of Paradise Lost? Sure. Like, where they get banished? There's, there's Milton all over. Right, so Frost. Paradise and Bloom. So there's this like thing mm -hmm. about having been ejected from Eden. And, there's, and that's kind of a promise. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that a kind of a promising moment, actually? In Milton, it's like, it's banned, it's exile, but it's kind of like the promise of the world itself, right? Right. So maybe there's like a different kind of promise. It's maybe not religious transcendence that we get here, but a kind of, 
promise in the world itself. The white luxurious it doesn't necessarily have to be God talking to you or something like that. Right? It's a kind of the material world contains thing, things to offer us. One of Frost's persistent themes is that we we make our own world. Um, yes, you were going to say? I just thought it was kind of cool that creates some kind of life experience so that both of them can stand for a moment in a strange world and kind of luxuriate in that yeah. for just a second. It's a real how pleasant that might be. Yeah. And you'll see that, as, especially in this book, there's lots of moments of real companionship with people. In fact, one of my favorite um, details in Mending Wall is that, that that hole in the wall in Mending Wall is large enough so that even two can pass abreast. Right? <coughs> Frost is always thinking about companionship. Right, that he wants to cross that wall with somebody else. He doesn't want to do it just alone. Um, and so there is a kind of wonderful community between these two men as he's, as he's tricked him, right? Um, to, to a point, you, you were David making Mary. This colon is one of the great pieces of revision that Frost did, right? So I, I, then I said the truth and we moved on. Colon, a young beach clinging to his last year's leaves. Grammatically, that colon is telling us, do you want to know what the truth is? Do you want to re really know what's happening? It wasn't a paradise in bloom. It was a young beach. Later, when Frost revised this poem for the collected edition, he took out this, the colon and put a period. It's a very different poem now. Right? And then I said the truth and we moved on, period. We don't know the truth in that case. Right? We can decide that he means the young beach uh, clinging to its last year's leaves, or we can decide it was really a paradise of bloom, or we can decide it doesn't really matter which one it is. Um, so that was a brilliant piece of punctuation revision on Frost's part. Uh, another, another favorite poem. So, yes? So, I, I, um, I don't look at it as a act of deception. Mm -hmm. I think the two are out on a stroll, it's a sunny day, and Frost is engendering in himself, uh, as we see in the, the way he constructs the poem, as well as in his companion, the sense of euphoria. Mm -hmm. And then at the colon, you, if you will, they just, he reconciles himself to the um, banal character of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a romp in the sunlight. Uh, okay. It's a, it's a holiday from reality. Yes. Right. Um, no and, deception. And he, he wants to um, he wants to celebrate those moments. Yes. But they do require pretense, pretense, right? Pretending of some kind. Mm -hmm. You have yeah, to act as it. Kind of a self-actuated mm -hmm. uh, yeah. feeling of euphoria, which he wants to transmit to his companion. Mm -hmm. That's why. Uh, One of the things that Frost said is that. Um, Poetry is the place where we learn more about belief than any other place. Poetry can teach us about belief more than any other thing can teach us. Um, and so this pretending, this believing, this making is something that poetry is doing all the time. So <clears throat> Frost said in other places that the, the poem, the, the one poem in everything that he wrote that really tells you who he is, and he said, the poem that most describes the biggest change in my character is recorded into Earthward. So that's this poem here. <laughs> Love at the lips was touch as sweet as I could bear, and once that seemed too much. I lived on air that crossed me from sweet things. The flow of, was it musk from hidden grapevine springs downhill at dusk? Frost is very much the Victorian, the late Victorian writer who just wants to live on air and on perfume and all those light, frothy things. I had to swirl and ache from sprays of honeysuckle that when they're gathered shake dew on the knuckle. I craved strong sweets, but those seemed strong when I was young. The petal of the rose, it was the sun that stung. So that's the early young man. Then things have changed for him. Now joy. Now no joy, but lack salt, that is not dashed with pain and weariness and fault. I crave the stain of tears, the aftermath of almost too much love, the sweet and bitter bark and burning clove. Wow, okay, that's different. Right? I hope you hear the echoes of after apple picking in there, the craving of ache, 
um, the feeling of wariness and fault. Um, those are emotions that come all through after apple picking. And that's now what he craves. He wants to feel pain. He wants to feel ache. When stiff and sore and scarred, I take away my hand from leaning on it hard and grass and sand, the hurt is not enough. I long for weight and strength to feel the earth is rough to all my length. No more of this leaning on, on my arm and feeling thing. I'm going to throw my whole body on the earth and really bruise it. Um, he's moved to earthward, toward earth. Um, and you, you'll, that might sound familiar from Birch's when he talks about swinging back and forth between heaven and earth and going, wanting to go toward heaven, but happy to return to earth. Frost, uh, in a poem, said, I would have it writ, I had a lover's quarrel with the world. And so that, he had that put on his gravestone. I had a lover's quarrel with the world. He is angry at, love, at the world because he loves it so much. He says in Birch's, Earth is the right place for love. Um, and there's, this, this is pretty sexual imagery in this poem, especially at the end there. Um, Frost loved the kind of transcendence and the kind of um, the promise that, 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 that life on Earth holds, but he hates the pain of it. And what he learned as a, as, as a young man is to start loving the pain. And this is part of what inspired his, his more modernist writing. Um, if you look at his early verse, it's too many grapevine springs and honeysuckle and dew. There's all those images in his early poetry. And he gets away from all that. And he starts writing a much tougher kind of poetry that says, the world is real. It is a dirty, messy place. And by golly, I still love it. I'm not going to be an escapist from it. I'm not going to leave it behind. The problem with late Victorian poetry is there's too much desire to escape the realities of life. So I'm going to write a poetry about here, about now, about what's real, um, and I'm still going to find transcendence somehow if I can. Um, and so this is this is kind of a, a, a program piece for him. Um, but it is a poem that's kind of just in the middle of the volume somewhere. The volume ends with this poem, The Needed Being Versed in Country Things, and so I want to spend a little bit more time on it. Um, because it's the last poem, and Frost put it on italics, right? All of his other poems in, in regular font. But in Needed Being Versed in Country Things, he puts it on italics, it's the last poem of the book, and it's a way of saying, hey guys, if you don't understand it now, read this poem, and it's going to unlock the rest of the volume. That's the kind of promise this poem is taking. And it's the need of being versed in country things. Right? So it's a poem about poetry. How does poetry instruct us about country things? Frost is a country writer. He's well associated with farming and all those kinds of good things. <clears throat> those of you who've been reading Renaissance poetry um, know that country things is also a sexual pun. Um, and that he's, he's being quite explicit about that as the poem goes on. The house had gone to bring again to the midnight sky a sunset glow. Well, that's not true. I'm going <laughs> to—I'm spoiling the plot of this poem a little bit, right? This poem is about a, uh, about a house that burned down, right? The house had gone to bring again to the midnight sky a sunset glow, which is to say, the house is on fire, and it's giving a nice—you know—even though it's midnight, it's on a fire at midnight, and so it's just trying to give a feeling of sunset to people. That's why the house went on fire, because somebody wanted to have some sunset colors in the middle of the night. So the, the poem begins with an exaggeration, with pretense, um, to put it in the terms of boundless moment. The house had gone to bring again to the midnight sky a sunset glow. Now the chimney was all of the house that stood, like a pistol, after the petals go. So now the house is all burned down. The only thing left of this house is a chimney. Um, the pistol, after the, stick, the petals go, so there's the sexual imagery. The barn opposed across the way that would have joined the house in flame had it been the will of the wind was left to bear forsaken the place's name. No more it opened with all one end for teams that came by the stony road to drum on the floor with scurrying hoofs and brush the mow with the summer load. The birds that came to it through the air at broken windows flew out and in. Their murmur, more like the sigh we sigh from too much dwelling, what has been. So the birds are out there sighing and murmuring, a very romantic thing. 
And you might recognize a little where um, over here. Sigh, we sigh from too much dwelling on what, um, what has been. That might recall to you the end of, of Road Not Taken, right? I should be telling this was a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Here the, 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 the birds are sighing about, oh, we missed this house, this poor house, it's all gone. There's a lot of romantic imagery going on here, right? Um, transcendent imagery of, you know, the house burning up to give sunset and for birds that are sighing because they grieve for the humans that have left this house. But then there's a turn in the poem. Yet for them, the birds, the lilac renewed its leaf, and the aged elm, though touched with fire, and the dry pump flung up an awkward arm, and the fence post carried a strand of wire. For them, there was nothing, there was really nothing sad. But though they rejoiced in the nest they kept, one had to be versed in country things, not to believe the Phoebe's wept. So uh, the question to you guys is, what does it mean to be versed in country things? Just realize that this is the way of the world. That's how things go. That's how things go. Things burn down. Humans leave. Chimneys are still standing. Barns are still standing. Nobody's crying. Nobody cares. It's one of the really tough lessons in Frost. The world doesn't care whether we live or die. Um, I, you, you all might remember the poem Out Out, which is the gruesome story about the kid who's at the sawmill and a saw, his hand goes off and then he dies and everybody's like, the, the, the poem says, because they were not the one who was dead, they went on. It's just like, kids die and, you know, we ask what's for dinner, right? Um, and nature's the same way. There's, there's nothing friendly about living in this world. This is why he has a lover's quarrel with it. He likes being alive, but it's a gruesome place. And if you're going to be, if you're going to understand the country, and if you're going to understand poetry, and if you're going to understand sex, you need to understand those things. That is just a broken place. Um, and so Frost is, is, is delivering a really kind of stern message about what country life means and what poetry means. The, the birds might sound like they're sighing to us because we need to pretend that they're sighing. Just like I need to pretend that's a paradise in bloom when it's really just a beech tree. We have these needs and we need to recognize that we're projecting onto the world, that we're making things up. Um, it's a, uh, this is at, at Frost's 80th birthday party, Lionel Trilling created a big scandal. It was this big party that was thrown for him. Lionel Trilling was the, was the hottest critic on the planet at, the, at that time. And he said, Frost poetry is terrifying. And everybody said, what are you talking about? He's a sweet little nature poet, right? He wears overalls. Uh, and, he, and he was like, no, no, no. You need to read Frost. He lives in a terrifying world. Uh, and so it was interesting. You know, People started coming up to Frost and saying, gee, are you really as scary as Lionel Trilling says? And he's like, no. <laughs> Because he knew that part of the source of his appeal as a popular poet was that he seemed to be given, giving us lots of reassuring comments, lots of reassuring ideas. And he is giving those reassuring ideas, but he's also lacing them with a strong dose of terror. It goes back to that thing in Earthward about how he wants to feel joy and pain. Right? Um, so he's, he's going that route. I, I see frowns from you, Nancy. What are you <laughs> what are you frowning about back there? I, I didn't I clearly didn't get all the sex I didn't get any of the sexual references in this poetry, so I now have to go back and completely reread all of this. I could spell it out, but I just really blush. Well you've just given me a few clues to spell Well country thing. Yes. Okay. But but <laughs> you the comment about him being um, terrifying I guess I'm starting to understand that from from what he does, he starts you from the very familiar. So many of his his poems, you know, start with something very simple that you know that you grasp and you think you understand, and then he takes you someplace completely different. Mm -hmm. And that and it's that familiarity that brings you in. Undercutting or subverting or turning on his head, the former part and that that, that part that's familiar. What I love about Frost is that there's there's lots of other poets who are doing what he's doing, where they're subverting and they're saying, you know, and they're kind of pulling the mask off, 
or making us feel worse about a situation that we might have felt good about. What's, I think, unique and powerful and special and uh, important about Frost is that he doesn't leave us there. Right? He's not a poet who depresses because he thinks that the world is a depressing, terrible place. He's a poet who wants to take us into those things as a way of reminding us that we can conquer this stuff. All of us know terror, right? All of us know death, all of us know disappointment, and we're here. And we're not just surviving, we're thriving in this place. And that's something that Frost liked to point out again and again and again. We know terror, we know how um, excruciating and painful life is, and you know what? We make a good life out of it anyway. And one of the ways we do that, he says, he says at one point um, in a letter to, to students at Amherst, um, he says, the world is background, uh, is chaos. Everything you need to know about the world is that it's chaos. And any kind of order we can put on that chaos is velvet. And we put that order on chaos by learning how to garden, by learning how to write poetry, by learning how to have good friends. All of those things help us organize chaos and make this a better place to live. And so he's doing that in these poems. This is why you need to be versed in country things, so you can take this depressing <laughs> feeling that the birds really don't care about us and still hear a murmur in it, right? still hear a sigh in it, still find something to rejoice in. Right? We know it's just beach leaves, but we still find ways of creating order. We fool ourselves into thinking for a moment that it's a paradise in bloom. And for that moment, it really is. This is the kinds of things that he comes back to. I don't know if that is helpful or not, Nancy. It looked like you, you were going to say something in the strike shoot. No? OK. I was wrong. What I've been trying to, try to argue is that these lyric poems are telling us how Americans think what the American mind is like. Um, what a great poem, right? Nature's first green is gold. And you know what he's talking about, right? Frost is, 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 is using real kind of grounded, physical observe, observation of the world, right? You all have seen those buds at the beginning of spring. They are green, but they're kind of a gold green. He's taking that physical observation. Nature's first green is gold. Her heart is human to hold. Her early leaves of flower. Right? And you've seen that happen, that the first, the first thing that comes out on the tree is the flower, and then it turns into leaf. And her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief, so down, dawn goes down to day, nothing gold could stay. Well, I feel better. Um, <laughs> that's a very depressing poem, except it's so beautiful, isn't it? It is so poignant. And that's Frost writing not just for himself and by himself. There is a whole boatload of Robert Herrick in that poem. There's a whole boatload of Ben Jonson in that poem. Frost isn't putting footnotes to Robert Herrick or Ben Jonson, but if you've read Robert Herrick and Ben Jonson, then you feel this to be a Johnsonian lyric. Frost, you know, and, and, and part of my, my beef here is that when you read a lot of Frost criticism, they talk about you know, his great strides he made in bringing American language into um, English poetry and that he was writing in the sound of sense. And all that is true, and I've written those things myself, too. But there's nothing kind of folksy about this language. There's nothing that kind of very American, which is what, how Pound described him, the very American. Uh, there's nothing very American about the language he's using here. This is kind of clear, clean, simple English prose um, turned into great gem-like poetry. And he's doing it by using the same old techniques that Robert Herrick did in the 17th century and that Rob Ben Johnson did in the 16th century. Um, this is classic lyric in the English style. And it's memorable. It's good stuff. Um, Here's another one, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I, I yeah, never Mary? thought about it before, but um, Herrick is gather you rose buds right Oh yeah. Wh which Johnson point? Do you have uh, a specific one? Oh, it, you know, there's a bunch of Ben Johnson poems that are kind of behind that. There, um, I'm thinking as about his, his um, 
the poem about his daughter's death in particular. Um, that's, that's, that's one echo that I hear. The Dust of Snow is another great little um, gem-like lyric that's so condensed and so wonderful. One sentence split over two stanzas. Right? The verb appears in the very center of the poem at the beginning of the second stanza. Sometimes I give this to students as prose and ask them to break it into poetry. It's very interesting where they choose to break the lines. Sometimes, uh, yeah, I've gotten very different poems from them. The way a crow shook down on me, the dust of snow from a hemlock tree, has given my heart a change of mood to save some part of the day I am. There's something about the rhythm of that poem and the structure of the poem that just kind of feels good. But here's my bad translation of it, right? I'm going to be a symbolist reading this. The way a crow, well, crows are symbols of death, right? They're there, they're told us the thing's dead. Um, and in fact, okay, so the way the crow, the symbol of death, shook down on me, the dust of snow, well, dust, of course, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, that's a symbol of death too. Of snow, well, snow is also a symbol of death. So the way the symbol of death shook, uh, so a symbol of death, of symbol of death, on me from a hemlock tree. Well, hemlock trees, of course, is a suicide, and Socrates, all that kind of stuff. So the way this death shook down on me, the death of death from death, has given my heart a change of mood, saved some part of the day I had moved. Uh, what's that? Best part of a really bad day. <laughs> it's the best part of a really bad day. And we've all had that kind of day, right? When, like, uh, you know, I love the expression that it's raining so hard, I have to put a hat on. Uh, so the, uh, I'm not going to spell that one out. So the, uh, we've all had that kind of day when one bad thing happens after another, after another, and we finally just say, what the heck, might as well enjoy it, right? Uh, and the poem at least seems to come from some, something of that kind of mood, but it's not that, right? There's something really mysterious that I still don't understand about the way this poem works. It is so relentlessly lugubrious, right? That, you know, here I am, I'm, in the, <laughs> I'm, I'm standing underneath a tree, and I feel some snow, and I look up, it's a crow, it's shaking snow on me. It's just like saying, go die, just go die. You're under a hemlock tree, I'm putting snow on you, I'm making you think about the dust of humanity, just go die. And he's like, okay, I feel better. <laughs> it's, a, it's an odd scene, it's an odd situation. It's because it's connection, right? I mean, like, he's like, he was all alone and alienated, but then, like, this crow, this, like, this, the this, crow's this, this piece to of me. nature moved, right? And he was touched, you know, and the distance between them was crossed. I mean, he's touched, and it's like, a, it's, yeah, it's just, it's connection. It's some kind of a, it's like nature reached out and dusted me. Mm -hmm. He got integrated. That, that sounding right to me. Mm -hmm. Kind of like this the era when, when people thought of poems kind of being a puzzle of meaning to unlock. Or is that something that has all that have been there before that? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's certainly more difficult poetry than the 19th century. But that's true of everything before and after the 19th century. I mean, the 19th century is a great age of like plain speaking. Uh, before and after that, it's, it's more complicated. I, I, I don't know how many would say it was a puzzle, though. Um, but maybe I'm overreacting to the word choice. Um, it I, go ahead. It kind of works a little bit like a there's a there's a, a nut to, to crack here. Right. So go 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 to you know students crack to try nut. to figure out figure out what's going on here. Yeah. I'm going to get to the curl that nut in a second uh, because I think you're onto something with that uh, that comment. Yes. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, um, which came first? This came before 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. Um, it probably did a little bit. Because I never noticed the connection before, but I just looked at the last one. Yeah. It was evening all afternoon. It was snowing, and it was going to snow. Right. The Blackbird sat in the sea of Yeah. I think there's definitely an echo. Yeah. But there are lots of times in romantic poetry when birds are sitting around and, and doing things. But a little, little, little Wallace Stevens story, right? So Wallace Stevens and Robert Frost are on vacation in Florida. Frost went down there for his health. Stevens went down there because he was rich. Um, <laughs> little, little insurance joke, joke there. So um, 
so they're talking, and, and Stephen said to Frost, he said, you know what the problem with you is, Robert, um, is that you write too much about subjects. Now, now Wallace Stevens is, is another one of the great modernists, and he and Frost are often clumped together as being out of the Emersonian tradition, whereas Pound and Elliot were coming out of an experimental tradition. Um, and so Stephen said, you know, your problem, Frost, is you write too much about subjects, right? I'm going to write a poem about death. I'm going to write a poem about beauty. I'm going to write a poem about actual life, I guess what Stevens is claiming. And Frost retorted by saying, your problem, Stevens, is that you write too much bric-a-brac. So you can, you can play around with that argument if you want to. Uh, so here's, here's the nut, I think, in this poem. And I, and I really, I don't know the answer to this. What, is, what the heck does it mean when he says, the way, the way a crow shook down on me? It's not the fact that, you know, the snow fell on him while he was standing underneath this death tree. It's the way the crow did it. And I want to know, how did the crow do it? Did he jump up and down? <laughs> did he flick it with his feathers? What was about the way that he did it? that changed his mood. It's not the fact of the crow. It's not the fact of the hemlock tree. It's not the snow. It's the way the crow did it. Um, that it's kind of a puzzle. <laughs> to go back to your point, what is it about the way the crow did it that changes his mood? Why do our moods change? He took a walk with a, with a friend of his late in life, a guy named Rabbi Reichardt. Um, and, and the rabbi stopped him and said, are you religious? And he said, well, sometimes I feel like I have nature favors. Sometimes I feel like nature has given me something, some kind of favor. And so you know, I, I think that this poem might be one of those nature favors. And we've come across a couple of them. Uh, okay. Again, just uh, toward the end of the volume, in fact, is this poem. Right? On a tree falling across a road, hear us talk. The tree the tempest with a crash of wood throws down in front of us is not to bar our passage to our journey's end for good, but just to ask us who we think we are, insisting on our always on our own way so. She likes to halt us in our runner tracks and make us get down in a foot of snow debating what to do without an axe. And yet she knows obstruction is in vain. We will not be put off the final goal. We have it hidden in us to attain. Not though we have to seize earth by the pole and tired of aimless circling in one place, steer straight off after something into space. That's a puzzler. <laughs> it's a sonnet, right? So he's given us three quatrains and a nice little Shakespearean ending. He's got a turn after the first two stanzas, um, so that's kind of a, he's, he's put a little Miltonic sonnet in there as well, as a Shakespearean one. Um, nature doesn't always give us favors of the inspiring kind, right? We've seen the Paradise and Bloom inspire him. We've seen even the dust of uh, the way a crow is shaking snow off a tree inspire him. Sometimes nature challenges us. We're walking along, we're trying to get home, and nature says, plop, here's a tree, I'm going to stop you right here. You're not going anywhere. Don't think that you can just get what you want. I'm going to make you work for it for a while. But, the, but nature knows that you know, it's going to lose. This goes back to that point, right? That, that Frost knows that we have something in us that will, will uh, emerge victorious from these, these, these vines. We will not be put off the final goal we have hidden in us to attain. That's kind of a core belief for Frost. So, <clears throat> a couple of things about this poem before we go to the last poem of the evening, for me at least. This is not a very good poem, right? I mean, it's, it, it's I'm, I'm trying to do my best Paul Grave, right? Paul Grave told us we're only supposed to like the best stuff. So that's why I've been ripping on Frost weaker poetry. This is not a very good poem. It's terribly didactic. It's saying, here's a tree. I'm going to tell you what it means now. If you haven't figured out what it means, I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that nature puts things in our past, and we're going to triumph over them. And so I want you to emerge from this poem with a nice, handy, tidy meeting that, yes, we will prevail over nature. And so it's, 
he's publishing it in 1924, but it could have come from his 20s when he was still writing the bad poetry that didn't get published. Um, and I can show you some of those bad poems. They're bad. They really are bad. It's not just me talking. He couldn't get them published for a reason. He wasn't one of these unsung, you know, heroes whose work needed to learn how to be appreciated before it could be published. His early stuff is just bad. Um, and he destroyed most of it, so we couldn't see how bad. The parts that have survived that he didn't destroy, it was like, okay, that was a stinker. I'm glad you didn't publish it. Because nobody else would at the time. So this is a pretty weak poem, but I'm hoping it rings a bell for you. I hope you're seeing elements in it that make you think, huh, huh. A little, a little earlier, a lot earlier, right, an hour ago, I asked you guys, like, what are the two poems that, you know, that have lodged where they're difficult to get rid of, right? Um, and you all threw out some candidates. Um, the Road Not Taken was one of them, and I mentioned to you that he had put that at the front of Mountain Interval because he knew what a great poem it was. The second great poem that lodged where nobody can get rid of it, or it's going to take a while to get rid of it, um, he didn't know was great when he wrote it. He didn't know it was great when he published it. He stuck it in the middle of the book as if it meant nothing to him. Oops, not that one. Stopping by woods on a snowy evening. It's page 87. So just, just in the middle of the book there, just in one of a number of lyrics. The first readers reading this book would have, could have passed right over it. Right? But it stuck. And he was kind of surprised that it stuck. And when people would ask him, hey, is that about suicide? He'd like back off. Uh, not say anything about it. He didn't know when he wrote this or when he published it that this would become one of his two poems that had become very firmly lodged, that made it into Paul Graves' Golden Treasure. It came as a surprise to him. And one of the things, one of the things that, that differentiates the bad frost from the good frost is a criterion that he set himself, and you, you might recognize it. He said at one point, if there are no tears in the writer, there will be no tears in the reader. If there's no surprise for the writer, there will be no surprise for the reader. There is nothing surprising about On a Tree Falling Across the Road. This poem is packed with surprise. And as I read it, think about how much it is like A Tree Falling on the Road, right? A Tree Falling on the Road, nature puts up an obstacle. We have hidden goals in us that we want to attain, and we're going to triumph over those obstacles. But doesn't he say in that poem, it says, to hear us talk? Right, so he's doing a little mocking there. And then he's, but the world continues to turn as if we could go spinning off straight if we yeah. wanted to. So you we know. don't really win. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, I, I, the reason, I, and the only reason I'm responding that way is that Frost often puts into titles things that he wants to kind of undercut the poem's meaning that's not in the poem. It's, mm -hmm. it's one of the ways he likes to cheat sometimes. Uh, so and, and, and so I, I, that's why I'm responding so strongly to that, is I think he's cheating in the title. I think the title came after as a way of saying, how can I make this a little more subtle? And yeah, I don't, I don't buy it. But maybe I'm doing too hard on it. Uh, Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not find me. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. So often, Frost's poems begin with him breaking boundaries with him crossing borders, with him being in a place that he doesn't know or doesn't recognize or shouldn't be. So in Boundless Moment, right, he should not be deceiving his friend, but he does it anyway. He breaks those barriers, he breaks those rules in order to make something happen. And so, yeah, he shouldn't be really stopping by somebody else's woods, but he's gonna do it. But then you kind of think, well, what's so strange about that? People stop all the time, you know? What, what is he being so uptight about? Maybe the breaking of barriers is more in his mind than it is in reality. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds is the sweep of easy wind down the flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. But I have promises to keep. Miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. Punctuation. <laughs> I talked about the colon in a boundless moment. In most editions of poetry, of uh, Frost poetry, uh, the editor, Edward Connery Latham, put a comma after dark. 
that the woods are three things. They're lovely, dark, and deep. If you listen to Frost read it, and the thing, the thing about Frost is that he, uh, he just kind of let Latham edit his work. He didn't reread to see what Latham was doing. And Latham added commas everywhere. He liked lots of dashes. He put lots of dashes in his poetry. And Frost was like, I don't care. People are reading it. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, scholars have gotten cranky about it. Um, and so it makes all the difference in the world. And if you listen to him read this poem, you will hear one comma, not two. He says the words, the woods are lovely, dark, and deep. Why are they so attractive? Because they're so dark and so deep. He wants that dust of snow, right? He wants to feel that he's in one of those moods when he's feeling the weight of the world so tremendously hard. But he's got hidden goals that he has to attain. And he promises to keep it, is the way he puts it in this poem. And so he moves on. And if you remember that miles to go before I sleep, he's moving on at that point. That's the way boundless moment ended. Then I said the truth and we moved on. We keep moving on in life. It's the same kind of moving on that happens in Out Out when the boy's arm is cut off and he, and he dies and the people go on living. We have to move on. Even when we've made a great poem and we've seen the paradise in bloom, even when we've had a moment uh, where we've really thought about um, the weight of the world, we have to keep moving. There's something inside us that has to go out and achieve what we think that we have in us to achieve. And for Frost, that was, that was continuing to write poems that he hoped would lodge somewhere that would be hard to get rid of. That's what I have so far. Do you all have any questions or comments, or should we just have cookies? I, I just have an observation. The, um, in the previous one, that there was like a Kantian inner drive. Like we're just like we have this, yeah, this kind of like we're programmed for this kind of like purpose in our life or something like that. And then here, the thing that propels us forward is promises to keep. It's a much, it's much less truly transcendent than the moving forward in this poem. It's like. It's about people, it's a commitment to his relationships, and, um, and I like that better um, than that, of the, the kind of like the programming of the, you know, of the previous more one. A little bit more reluctant. Yeah, the other one is very, um, you know, it's like space, like, finally, you know, Kennedy, like, let's like, yeah, psh, let's like go out into space, and like, we're going to do amazing things, and because we just do, that's our nature. Right, and this one is... Less driven, but it, but I but I, I like the way that he's like he's committed to to people. It's his commitments to people that keep us going. And so you're saying it's more driven. You're saying it's more it's less, reluctant. This is less, this less driven. driven. You're saying it's more reluctant. Um, those are both words that describe moods. And one of my favorite descriptions of lyric poetry come from Emerson, where Emerson says, "Poems are but a moment's mood, and our moods do not believe in each other." Our moods don't believe in each other. And that is that is true of lyric poetry, and I think that's true especially of any, um, any of the great writers. Because what happens with great writers is that they have one or two, sometimes three, but usually it's just one or two ideas in their head. They've only got one or two of them, but they keep chewing on that idea. And then when they chew on that idea, they're chewing on that idea in different moods, right? So he's reluctant or less driven in this poem. The other palm tree falling across the road is a similar type of scene. It's a similar kind of situation. He's more Kantian. He's more driven in that poem. He's in a different mood. He's still confronting the same issues. Um, and so I think that one of the things that, that lyric poetry asks us to do is to think about, okay, what are, what, are the, what are the issues that this poet is really trying to think about, going into depth on, and then watching that poet struggle with those ideas and adopt different moods and different attitudes towards the same kind of thing. We've, we've seen all of the poems in this Grace Notes section of New Hampshire. We can go back and look at the other narrative poems and see that they're reflecting on many of the same, same issues. Um, but there's only one or two things that really Frost is thinking about in his poetry. Okay? Michael, could you talk a little bit about a couple of decades ago, we would have called the speaker. Uh -huh. <laughs> Under we still call it the speaker. Okay. Yeah. That's still so, the done thing. 
Oh, I, I left this world too long ago to know. So, um, I think probably there's a tendency to read the I as Frost himself. Mm -hmm. um, what's your thinking about that? What's the current thinking about that? Oh, you know, you can get, uh, you can get people all over the map at kind of whatever feeds their thesis. Um, <laughs> was that too cynical a statement? Uh, but I, I think that what we see in uh, Frost and in, and in most writers is that they're they're projecting one one part of themselves and they're they're thinking about that projection. I don't I don't think that we need to think about Frost speaking that at that time because we're always reflecting on it. And I think that in our own lives we we often look back at, at our past actions and we say I don't know which Mary did that. It's not the Mary that I am now. Um, and that can even happen as earlier as an earlier conversation of the day. I don't know what I was thinking when I was having that conversation. I, you know, I, I was projecting a kind of person that I don't feel like I really was at that moment. So we, we do this all the time in our, our daily life. Um, I don't know why we wouldn't do it in poetry as well. Um, there, are some, there are some writers who present themselves as just autobiographical, and we get that in the 70s confessional music movement mostly. But there are others that don't. I, I think Frost is, he's playing around with persona, but they're his persona, the pieces of himself. That was a bad, vague answer, I'm sure. How would you, if you would, um, like talk to or convince somebody that's maybe 18, 20, 24, young person, mm -hmm. um, that, that a book like uh, New Hampshire is like relevant for them? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm thinking about all the bad classes I've taught. The, uh, I, I, I try to make them touch the kind of human moment for us. I, you know, I haven't done that tonight with you guys, um, except kind of vaguely to kind of point at um, the way that you know, we've all had, you know, I'm thinking about the discussion of uh, Dust of Snow, we've all had bad days, we've all found ways of happening, to, uh, of, of having a bad day turn good for inexplicable reasons. And so what I will do in a class, especially in an introductory class, is I'll do that poem and say, tell me about a time when that's happened to you, right? And so the students will share a couple of stories about that experience. Um, and and at, at the end of that discussion, I say, well, does that have anything to do with the way the crow did it? Right, so I try, I try to keep that part hidden from them. Right. So we talk all about the snow and that kind of piling on of bad things happening to us. Um, and then when they've completed it, I said, well, so what does it mean when he says the way? And that gives them something to think about when they go back to their dorm. Uh, I don't know that it's worked spectacularly, but that, that's what I've tried. Other things? All right, well, thank you all. Oh, I'll have yeah. something else, and maybe this is for you, and for me, The poem about feeling the rough earth. Mm -hmm. Would you go so far as to say that he's almost masochistic? Bigger than <laughs> Frost has very few sex scenes, but when they when he has them, they're like, whoa, whoa, what's going on there? And the, the scene in Birches is like, man, where'd that come from? Um, so, yeah, yeah, it was, um, it's late 19th century. <laughs> he came, he came out of that era, but. Yes? No, it's contact. I, I knew you were going to It's contact. It's like that feeling of like of roughness and aggression. It's like, you know, you know, like the rose petal, back then the rose petal was thorn enough, right? But it's like, you feel, you start to just feel you know, the world is like you're no longer connecting with it. You want, you know, it's that roughness, right? That sort of rough contact. So that's, that's, that's how I read it. Yeah, You're welcome. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. When, um, when I finished the, the piece on Fahrenheit 451, we showed a clip. It was a speech that... Um, Bragger. Say again. Bragger. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Some days I do nouns, some days I do verbs. Um, 
that it, it was a speech that Bradbury was giving to a writing group, and he said, "If you want to be a if you want to be a writer, you have to be a reader." And he and he admonished the group of writers to read every night before bed a poem, a short story, three things: a poem, a short story, and a what was the third? No, I can't remember. Say again. An article, and some sort of an article, an essay, an, an essay, an article, an essay, a short story, and a poem. And this is why we're supposed to read poetry. I just read the poem. <laughs> <laughs> skip the essays. Skip the poem. Skip the short stories. Um, thank you very much for coming tonight. This has been a lot of fun. We also have with us Martin who has produced for us and is available on our library website a finding a, a research guide to Robert Frost. Based principally, uh, first on items we have in our own collection and then how to do further extensive research on Frost. This is adding a dimension to these discussions that we didn't have in past years. It was, every other one was a one-off. Come in and have a lovely evening, a great discussion, read the book, go home, think about it. But this gives us the ability to go on and study a bit more in depth and to find resources. And it's because of our colleague, Martin Shapiro, that we have this available to us. Thank you. Um, if you have not picked up this flyer outside, please do. This is the flyer for the rest of the, of the series that we will have during this year. And the gentle lady sitting in the front will be closing it out for us. <laughs> so we have poetry at least bookended in this series. We are also offering another series this year to which we invite all of you to come, the neighbors as well as people in the, in the, in, within the, the university community. And it's a series called Exploring Social Justice. And we received a grant to be able to do this series. And there will be one exhibition that starts in the library next week of the stories of forgiveness. And it will be a series of 18 banners that we displayed through the library that are stories of forgiveness. The first speaker for us will be Sister Helen Prejean, whose um, work, whose passionate work against the death penalty was made into a movie and a band. Susan Sarandon played Sister Helen Prejean. Well, Sister Helen will be here on campus on um, Tuesday, September the 30th. And we have this flyer outside as well. The next speaker will be um, Reed Brody, who is the counsel and spokesperson for Human Rights Watch. We actually had to change his date because he had to go to court. And it, he's out as a true advocate, both in the, the sort of legal sense, the British legal sense, as well as the, the advocacy as we think of it on Human Rights Watch. Then we have an AU graduate. Um, her name is uh, Andrea Kalin, who is a filmmaker. And she's coming to show her film on Syria, and there's, all of these are followed by discussions and receptions. Um, that one is in February. In March, we have a woman who, put, who runs a center for people who have been given asylum in the United States. And frequently when we hear that somebody in a tough spot has been given asylum, you think that that's the answer, and it's done. That's actually just the beginning of a whole new set of challenges. And so she's here to talk to us about what it's like to take a group of people who have come from hardships and, in, and yet into another set of hardships to make a new life for themselves. And then we're going to end with a Jesuit priest from Bogota, Colombia, who runs the Schools of Forgiveness. And it's teaching <coughs> teachers how to talk to grade school children about living a life that is not full of violence. Um, and he's been doing some very powerful work. So that's another series to which all of you are invited. And the flyers are outside on the table um, as you leave tonight. Thank you again. Thank you.